Welcome back to Shameless Popery. I'm Joe Heschmeyer. So I'm particularly excited about today's episode. This is the first time I've done an interview on this show. Uh, everything else so far has just been me talking or interacting with clips. But to actually sit down with the person uh, in person was a real occasion of joy. And the person I sat down with was my own bishop, Archbishop Joseph Nauman. And for those of you who know him, you probably know him from his pro-life work. He's particularly well-known. He was the head of the USCCB's uh, Committee on Pro-Life Activities for three years, and he's been very influential and outspoken on the pro-life issue. His love for life and his defense of the defenseless, uh, which we see particularly around the pro-life issue, but you can see it in other areas, like his outspokenness on issues like racism and a variety of other places where he sees a group being kind of downtrodden. I think this dates back to really before he was born. When his mother was pregnant with him, a week before Christmas, his father was murdered by an ex-employee or a man he'd actually sent home from work. Uh, he was stabbed to death in a horrible situation. And so Archbishop Nauman grew up uh, with a single mother and uh, was cared for by one of the local priests, which really helped inspire a love of the priesthood for him. He has a beautiful, incredible biography. Uh, growing up in St. Louis, having this dual concern, I think, for both the African-American community and the pro-life movement that we see even before he became bishop. And then he went from that to becoming uh, an auxiliary bishop in St. Louis. And then in 2005, he became the Archbishop of Kansas City in Kansas, where he is today. So I wanted to sit down with him and just talk with him about whatever issues came up. Um, his Episcopal motto, by the way, I, I have to share this, is life will be victorious, uh, vitae victoria erit, which comes from Pope John Paul II's pro-life encyclical, Evangelium Vitae, on the gospel of life. And it's worth quoting John Paul II here, because I think this really captures something at the heart of Archbishop Nauman as a person and as a bishop. And so the line is this, it is from the blood of Christ that all draw the strength to commit themselves to promoting life. It is precisely this blood that is the most powerful source of hope. Indeed, it is the foundation of the absolute certitude that in God's plan, life will be victorious. It's a beautiful, inspiring message of hope, even when things sometimes look very bleak, when they look very dark. And I think you see that mentality, that spirituality reflected in everything Archbishop Nauman says and does. Last point before we get uh, into the interview itself, you may be wondering where the questions come from. I reached out to Society 315. Now, I am an apologist for Catholic Answers, and Society 315 is our monthly givers club. It's anywhere from $10 on up. And it's one of the ways that we have uh, a regular source of revenue. And so I, I reached out to donors to Society 315. We just sent a mass email and said, what question would you ask a bishop if you had a chance to? <laughs> and we got about 30 replies. From that, we narrowed the list down uh, to kind of a top 10 list, which, as you can see in, in the video we're about to watch, uh, I just ask Archbishop Nauman to randomly choose a number, and, and we kind of go from there. Uh, oh, yeah, actually, sorry, one final, final note, which is on a technical uh, level, this is not the greatest in terms of either audio or video. You can see from me doing it myself, how important the work of people like Jack and Zach in our video department are as they do their work behind the scenes to make sure you have crisp, clear uh, video, crisp, clear audio. And so I was in Archbishop Nauman's office doing what I could with the equipment I had, but you will, you'll be able to tell it's, it's maybe not the same level. So I encourage your patience and generosity with any technical um, difficulties, we'll say. With that, let's get to the interview. So the format for today, I collected from Society 315, the Catholic Answers donors, a series of 30 different questions. We narrowed that list down to 10, and so I'm going to have you randomly choose a number, 1 through 10, and we'll cover as many of them as time permits. Sounds good, Joe. Good to be with you and with your listeners and viewers. Thank you very much. What would you like for the starting number? Uh, let's go with number seven. We're going to start off easy, by which I mean hell and divine foreknowledge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is Nikki in Portland, Oregon, who asks, My teenage son is struggling with the problem of evil in the world and the existence of a good and loving God. More specifically, 
Why does he allow people to be born that he knows will go to hell? Why does he allow people to go to hell? And how can God even allow for a hell if he's love and all that good? He, I think she means her son, has not been able to find a satisfactory answer to this question, and it is keeping him from embracing the faith. Thank you so much. Yes, well, it's that's a great question that your son's asking, and I, it's one that's been asked for, I think, centuries, as long as, as uh, the gospel's been preached. And, you know, I think it, it, it it's best to situate the answer in that, while God, it's true, he, he knows everything, he knows the future, but everything is present to him in that sense. But it doesn't mean that he he's creating somebody so that they will go to hell. Uh, but they'll have freedom and they'll have choices. And that, you know, I think the whole understanding of hell is that life in this world has meaning and has purpose and that there are real consequences to the choices that we make, both for good and for, for bad. And, and, you know, so it's God's created us in his own image, and part of that is our freedom to be able to choose to do good, uh, to follow his desire for us, what he's created us to be, or unlike everything else in the created world, you know, like trees and mountains and... and um, animals they they can just be what they were created to be but we have this this unique gift that is a god god given gift uh, to have the freedom to choose and it, it really is um it's god respecting our dignity otherwise we would just be kind of machines and a town just just machines that are just doing um what inevitably we would have to do with no freedom for it. That makes a lot of sense. I think the way you said it, that life has consequences, that this life actually has meaning and purpose and that there are results of our actions is a good frame for it. Because the alternative that everyone, no matter what they do, ends up the same way does seem to deprive all the moral battles of life of any real significance or meaning. Yeah, I mean, of course, the church never has said anybody is in hell with, with certitude, um, and there, there are respected theologians that can argue over how many people they think may be there or not, um, and we do believe in, in God's great gift of mercy, and we never know what the person's final disposition is at the end of their life, but, um, but yeah, that uh, this life is real, it's important, and we're we're given this opportunity to make choices, uh, to seek to love the Lord and to live up to the dignity that he's created us or not. And the, those choices are real. Life has um, real purpose and real meaning. It's not just uh, doing what we've been programmed to do like a, a computer program. So you mentioned the theologians who have the divergent views of how many people are in hell. Do you feel comfortable venturing a guess in that area, or is this an area where you would just say we leave it to the mercy of God? Yeah, I, I, I don't. I mean, I, uh, but I, I do think you know you you look at the biblical passages, and they emphasize both. They emphasize God's mercy and and how He's constantly forgiving people and extending mercy. But you also have the passages that said you know that. Um, that the the way to perdition is wide, yes. and uh, the pathway to heaven is narrow. So uh, I think uh, we leave it to God in terms of sorting all of those things out. You know, fortunately, that's the one thing you know, we don't really have to worry about judging others. But the key thing is is our decisions that that you and I make. The decisions I make have real importance and. And wait, and and God has given us this great dignity. Not only do our decisions impact us, but they impact others as well. And um, so, what we choose to do with our life has real meaning, real purpose, real consequence. Excellent, thank you. Would you like to choose another number? <laughs> Let's choose uh, number one. All right, number one, Eucharistic revival. 
So we've got a couple of different questions about the Eucharistic revival. So I'm going to read you two of them, and then you can offer your thoughts. So the first is from Hunter from Saginaw, Michigan, who asks, Your Excellency, thank you immensely for fielding these questions. Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi. For those who don't know, that's the law of worship is the law of belief. Actions tend to speak louder than words, and it seems that changes in how we act toward the Eucharist, ad populum consecration, so the altar facing the people, prevalence of lay ministers, removal of altar rails, reception standing and in the hand, have impacted Eucharistic faith more than words. To be fair, the words coming from the Eucharistic revival are fantastic, but without a restoration of liturgical action supporting these words, I fear it may have a dulled effect. What can you and your fellow bishops do to promote the actions that support belief in the real presence? And then as you're thinking about that one, we'll jump down from Michigan to Texas, where Rhea asks, is there an emergency bishop bat phone? And then, how can we infuse our laity and our churches with reverence and piety for the Eucharist when our priests and Eucharistic ministers give people a hard time when receiving on the tongue? I'm at a loss and often weep for us all. Everyone speaks about this being normal, but when Jesus died on the cross and said, if we knew who he was, this would not happen. Well, it is so true. If people really knew what we were receiving, we would not do it so carelessly as of receiving a random munchie in line. It is so sad. Please help. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. And and um, I, I'm very enthused about the Eucharistic revival, and I th I, I'm really gratified that the bishops are united in this effort to try to renew within our Catholic people this love for the Eucharist. And, you know, when Pope John Paul, St. John Paul, wrote his encyclical on the Eucharist, he, he talked about his hope was to renew what he called Eucharistic amazement. And, um, you know, I think that's truly my hope as well. And and I, I believe it's already having an impact. Um, and one of the stories... I tell uh, sometimes in, in confirmations is that when I was early here in the archdiocese, there was a couple that invited me to their home for dinner. And, you know, we're a small archdiocese, but still there's 200,000 Catholics. I, I can't go to everybody's home for dinner. If I did, I'd be fatter than I am now and, and not getting much done. But for some reason, I felt the Holy Spirit was... Uh, asking me to accept this invitation. So I went, the, the wife was a very engaged, very devoted Catholic, very involved with her parish. The husband was not Catholic, but he went to Mass every Sunday with his wife and, and children. And I think his wife thought, if I came to dinner, this would push him over the edge, and then he would become Catholic. So we had this nice dinner, good conversation. I was really impressed with this man. I mean, he loved Jesus. He read the Bible every day. He had no problem even with our, our countercultural moral teachings. He embraced all of those. So I finally said to him as the night was getting close to an end, I said, I said, why aren't you Catholic? You seem to believe everything that we believe. You you go to Mass every Sunday with your family. And he said, he said, Archbishop, he said, it's true, I go to Mass every Sunday with my family and when they go up when the communion time comes, they go up to receive, and I stay in the pew. And he said, and I, I observe people. And he said, I notice how many people, they seem so casual. They seem so unaware of what they're doing, who they are receiving. He said, if I believed what you believe, and I, he said, I know what you believe, that you believe that Jesus Christ is present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, uh, that you would, uh, that I would crawl up the aisle to receive God. And um, so he didn't become Catholic after our dinner, but he did become Catholic uh, a few years later. And I was at their parish and celebrating Mass. They were present, and you know what? He did not crawl up the aisle. <laughs> but he did receive the Eucharist with great attention and reverence and devotion. And I, you know, I think that's what we're hoping that the Eucharistic revival will will kind of um, jar us into realizing, because the Eucharist is so available to us. Uh, sometimes it, we can become too accustomed to this miracle that we're participating each and every time we go to the Eucharist. So um, 
You know, I think in terms of the externals, um, my conviction is the Mass should be celebrated beautifully and reverently. And a lot of the, you know, I think a lot of the things that were mentioned in the first comments, um, they, yeah, they can help uh, with people's devotion and receiving the Eucharist, but we can receive the Eucharist de- with devotion and with love and reverence. It, you don't necessarily need a communion rail. I mean, there are some of our newer parishes that, that actually have stations where people can come and kneel if they want to, and that, that's beautiful. I, I hope nobody in, in, a, in this archdiocese has the experience that he or she was describing about, you know, that um, they were being discouraged to, to show this reverence. Um, but I think in showing reverence, you, you, you have to be aware of other people. Uh, so sometimes when people uh, kneel down, it can be a, a hazard to the people behind them uh, tripping over there. So there's those logistic things. But I think there's we, we can bring reverence to the Eucharist, whether um, you know we're celebrating it uh, facing... <laughs> The people are were ad orientum. Um, both have a, a spirituality about them uh, that I think uh, invites people to really understand uh, the beauty and the power of the Eucharist. I, you know, I was um, another uh, event I had. There was when I uh, when I was early here in Kansas, and it was a really hot day in August. And the air conditioning at my residence went out, so naturally, that's always on the hottest day. The air conditioning goes out, and this repairman came in. He and I struck up a conversation, and he he said, uh, "Archbishop, he said I grew up a Methodist. My wife and I we go to an evangelical church, but he said, but I consider myself more Catholic than Protestant." I said, "Really?" I said, "Well, why do you say that?" And he said, "Well, first of all, my wife and I we have ten children." I said, "Wow, that's impressive. Thank you for your openness to life." And but then he said, "He said, but more than it, he said, I believe what you believe about the Eucharist." And he said, "I don't know how my Protestant brothers and sisters can read the sixth chapter of John's Gospel and not believe that Jesus is truly present." He tells us, "You know, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no life within you." I said, wow, you should be Catholic. You know, He wasn't ready to sign up for RCIA at that point. But what a beautiful testimony of this, um, this evangelical Protestant about what we really believe. And uh, yeah, I think read the sixth chapter of John's Gospel. And of course, Jesus doesn't, when, uh, you know, John says that, you know, Many of the people, many of his own disciples began to leave him and return to their former way of life. And he doesn't say, wait, wait, <laughs> this was just a metaphor I was talking about. Now he turns to the apostles and said, are, are you going to leave as well? And that's one of Peter's shining moments, to whom shall we go? You have the, we've come to believe you're the Holy One of God. Um, and, and so, you know, I think as Catholics, we have this great gift of the Eucharist, and it, it is it's something that people throughout the church's history have sacrificed heroically just to be able to go to the Eucharist. You, you read Father Walter Cheesek's books about celebrating Mass in the, in the gulags and at great risk and how these men would fast all day just to receive the Eucharist. And I think because it's it's accessible to us. Um, we have to really jar ourselves and, and realize every time we receive the Eucharist, it's this profound miracle of God's grace, and and He comes to us to strengthen us so that we can we can continue uh, to follow Him and 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 to renew the life that was given to us, His very life that was given to us through the waters of baptism. So yeah, I'm very hopeful that this. Eucharistic revival uh, it is already, I think, it, it's awakening people to deeper reference. And so I think both of the questioners, you know, they're, they're bringing up um, good observations, not too dissimilar from that first man, you know. 
and to realize that even when we're going to receive the Eucharist, we, we're not doing it, we're not acting in a way so that other people will think we're holy. But people are watching us. And, and as priests, as a bishop, you know, I have an even higher responsibility in terms of um, the devotion I show. Uh, so we all have a role to play, and, and the celebrant does, but also the congregation. And um, our Catholic churches, you know, I, I, th- I think um, one of the things we've tried to do with, and I would say I'm, I've not been very successful in this, but when I was growing up, you know, you go into a Catholic church and it was silent and, and because there was reverence because the the blessed sacrament of Jesus Christ was present there and it was silent to respect others who who were praying and I think uh, I, I like a lot of our new churches where we have these kind of gracious areas, gathering areas because it, it's important for the community to gather but um, you know, it, it's, it saddens me sometimes um, to hear the, the, the conversation level that's going on in our churches. And, um, yeah, I think as priests and bishops, we need to instruct our people, remind our people um, that this, this space is different from anyone, any other place because Jesus Christ is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Very well said. The difficulty of maintaining the silence. You could start with my three-year-old if you want. <laughs> but it really does speak to that reverence. I mean, this is something that non-Catholics regularly notice, is how much Catholic, quieter a Catholic church actually is. And they might find that inviting, or they might find that off-putting, depending on how they understand what's going on. It's not a social hour. It's not a social gathering once we're in church. Yeah. I mean, the very way that our churches are built, too, um, I always, uh, some years ago, I was out in in Orange, California, was, I think, for the Knights of Columbus. And the diocese there had just uh, acquired the... Yeah, the, the Crystal former, Cathedral, yeah. Yeah, the Crystal Cathedral. But they showed us a tape of, of uh, Robert Schuller talking to the priest of the diocese and saying that because they had a higher bid... They could have taken a higher bid from a university that wanted the property, but they chose to take the one from the diocese that was getting them out of the debt they were in. But um, it took the lower bid because he wanted it to continue to be a place of worship. And he said, and he said he was glad it was going to the mother church. And he and he said, and the Catholic Church always has had this great appreciation for beauty. Um, that he he kind of said our Protestant churches haven't always um, uh, emphasized that, but uh, you know the reason we you know uh, and of course Jesus can be present in very simple edifice and he was born in very humble circumstances, but it's um, we try to make our churches as beautiful. Not that we can ever make anything uh, that's. Uh, worthy of, of God, but it's an expression on our part to give God the best. And, and so we try to create these spaces that elevate the mind and, and the heart to God. Um, but, you know, people have the preferences in terms of architecture and art, all those kind of things. But, but I think overall, you know, the church has always tried to emphasize that we're, this isn't just a meeting room that we're in. This this is holy ground because Jesus Christ is present. Yeah, very well said. I'm sure we could talk much more on that, but let's try to cover a few more questions. You want to choose another number? Sure. Three is a good biblical number. There you go. And fittingly enough, this is about Episcopal clarity and charity. So this is actually one of your own parishioners or members of your diocese, Alexander from Manhattan, Kansas. Oh, uh, that's just outside the diocese. Oh, that's right. It's the line. That's right. It just crosses the border. I take it back. <laughs> <laughs> but it, a Kansan number. <laughs> well, at least in your ecclesiastical province. Anyway, she asks, with a humble heart, help us 
the faithful to navigate these surreal times we're living through? How can we ask for clarity and charity from you dearest bishops of nowadays? How can we be Catholics of courage? Praying. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I appreciate the sentiment. I, I, I'm assuming she's kind of talking about that, uh, that sometimes bishops disagree, huh? Yeah, it struck me there are a hundred things she could mean. I had some ideas, but I didn't want to impose my own. Yeah, well, that's what it struck me that, you know, that, and, and I've had people say that and, uh, to me, you know, personally, that they find it uh, less than edifying that bishops are disagreeing. Um, sometimes on, you know, on, on important issues. But my comment would be that that that's always been the case. You know, you go back to the Gospels. Paul corrected Peter <laughs> um, when Peter and and Peter was grateful for the correction that Paul gave him because he was he wasn't he was it was over. You know, he was telling everybody else that they had to follow uh, the Mosaic law, but then he himself wasn't doing it, and and um, so there's there. Are, and and of course you know Santa Claus Saint Nicholas uh, part of the tradition is that he actually I think punched uh, one of his uh, Arian at one of the ecumenical councils so it's been worse uh, historically where these uh, these disagreements um, but I think it's one of the you know sometimes um, uh, that's how the church clarifies its teaching and 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 sharpens the the meaning of our teaching as well. Uh, you know, I take very seriously my responsibility uh, to to be a teacher of the faith to the people in my jurisdiction. And so, when another bishop may say something or write something that's in a national publication, it affects the people in my diocese. And sometimes, if I think um, that that uh, the, the the bishop's well intentioned, but I don't agree with what he said. I I, ha, I have a responsibility to try to provide the the truth uh, to God's people, but at the same time, I think to always think with, with charity about those I disagree with, you know that, and to be humble about it. I have to be true to uh, to to what I believe is. Um, the authentic understanding of the gospel and the church's teaching, um, but uh, I also have a responsibility uh, to have charity uh, towards those that perhaps see things differently. And and um, and you know, I think the beauty of our Catholic Church is that we've always uh, believed that unity is essential, and we can't allow even. When we don't always agree, we can't allow that to divide us. And, you know, the Protestant principle is kind of, if you don't agree, you start your own church and you, and, and you keep this division. And yet we know that, you know, Jesus prayed for us when he, in John's Gospel in the 17th chapter, where he says he prayed for those of us who would come to believe in him, that we might be one as he and the Father are one. And so... The, so that the world would come to believe. And so our unity is really important in that we have to preserve that. At the same time, you know, I think unity doesn't mean that we're never going to have uh, differences and that somehow that's how the, the doctrine of the church becomes clarified. You know, it makes sense to me, I guess, because I think in every healthy marriage, there are arguments. <laughs> yes. And so the couple who says... We want to stay united so we're never going to argue is on course to have an icy, unhappy marriage because you can't just sweep problems under the rug. I want to follow up on the first of the two things. You talked about the moral duty even to clarify teachings when other bishops are obscuring, even unintentionally. I'm paraphrasing you here. But do you think, would it be fair to say bishops should be even louder in this rather than quieter? You know, if the question is about clarity and charity... Do you see a need for more public disagreement? Because I know, obviously, there are a lot of conversations in the background. But if bishops are giving magazine interviews and things that you think are going in the wrong direction, do you think brother bishops have a duty to stand up and say, that's a misstatement, 
That's incorrect. Well, you know, I I feel um, I feel I have a responsibility. I think each bishop has to discern this. But I was really edified that it was really U.S. bishops that launched a kind of an international correction for what the German <laughs> Church is doing. And um, you know, I think that was really important, and I think that was part of our our responsibility. Um, as bishops, and of course, ultimately the Holy Fathers, he he is the focus of unity for us, and and uh, an important part of his role is to be the guardian of the faith. But each bishop, we have we share in that responsibility and role, and so I think, um, yeah, I think it, it's it's important that um, to the best of our ability that we preserve the doctrine, the teaching of the church, and pass it on to the next generation in its integrity. And and so at times, does that mean we're going to have to disagree with some other bishop in our own conference or maybe in another part of the world? Uh, yes, uh, sometimes it will be. But to do that with clarity, but with respect and charity as well. Wonderful. Since you brought up the German bishops, I'll just add a lot of questions from Texas, by the way. So Lance from Abilene, Texas asks, what is the process for holding German or any other bishops and priests accountable for blessing and or conducting homosexual marriages? And why isn't it happening? Now, maybe it's clarity. Conducting may not be, it's a blessing. Um, but then Bill from the Woodlands, Texas asks, what is the process for Pope Francis to remove a bishop or cardinal that is in schism with the church? For example, the German synodal way voted to approve same-sex blessings, et cetera. Yeah, well, um, you know, I think as a, as a bishop, I have a responsibility to, and to, to share um, with the Holy Father, um, you know, as much as I can, the, what I believe is, is required in terms of fidelity to the teaching of the church, but ultimately, you know that's that's his role of governance. Um, you know, I, but I think it, it's an awesome responsibility, huh? To to um, to keep the church true to its teaching, but also to do this with charity and try not to drive people away from the church. Um, and you know, I think uh, Pope Francis, with the German question, is he said some pretty. Uh, blunt uh, things as as he is one to do at times, and you know he said the Germany doesn't know, need another evangelical Protestant church; they already have one. <laughs> <laughs> and and so you know I, I think he has um, made efforts to try to correct what's happening in Germany. Um, you know, different different popes have different styles in terms of exercising that responsibility, but. Um, yeah, but I, 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 you know, I, I think it's um, it, it's important for all of us to to try to understand, and I think to to one of the great gifts that John Paul gave the church was the Catechism, um, where we can go and we can find the authentic teaching of the church and. When you have bishops saying, well, they think the catechism ought to be revived, uh, uh, revised in a certain area, as we've had some bishops say, I think we, we need to call them to accountability, you know. Um, but, you know, I'm old enough to have lived through um, a, a lot of chaos in the church. And I remember when the Dutch catechism was out there, uh, it was giving a lot of confusion to people when I was uh, young and you know but fortunately the church over time corrected that and and the fruit of that was giving us uh, the current catechism so I think you know the Holy Spirit's working within the church and I would just encourage pray for the Pope he's got an awesome responsibility pray for bishops we have a, a very important responsibility as well to be teachers and defenders of the faith. Well, thank you very much. Well, we have questions four, five, six, eight, nine, and 10. Want to choose? 
Uh, yes, let's go with number five. Number five, evangelization. Timothy from Naples, Florida asks, I'm a new Catholic from an evangelical background. Why is it that when I ask fellow Catholics about sharing the gospel, they either don't know what I'm talking about or say something about working in a soup kitchen? By share the gospel, I mean speaking, preaching, the charisma. We are sinners destined for hell unless we repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, and well, thanks for the question and the observation. And, you know, one of the things um, we did in our archdiocese, and I was really taking this uh, from other places, I think Denver had done this the year before, was we had all of our priests during this past Advent preach on the charisma. <laughs> Because I think a lot of people don't know what is the charisma, and it's the core of what we believe as as Catholics, and we all should. So we wanted our priests to to speak about the fundamental teaching of the church and the gospel and its meaning and what it, and how that applies and and changes uh, our lives, affects our lives in very real ways. So I, I appreciate what he's saying that um, that we need to we need to be able to explain to everyone um, the 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 core of what we believe as Catholics. So one of the things I'll say, you know, we believe what no other world religion believes that God actually became a human being, that He pursues us, that He's seeking us out and desires to have this relationship. No other world religion believes this, and that he actually came in and shared our humanity so that we could share in his divine life. This is the beauty of, of our Catholic faith and belief, and that uh, this, this God, he loves us even in our weakness, even in our vulnerability. He doesn't love us because we do everything right, our perfect all the time, and and he was constantly forgiving people, and of course that mercy continues today uh, with the sacrament of reconciliation, and and recent popes have put such a big emphasis on divine mercy. So, so knowing what makes Christianity and Catholicism unique, uh, I think is important to be prepared to share that. And I think there are a lot of good things that are that have risen up, and a lot of them are lay apostolates in, in part of, of equipping people better to be able to, to share the truth and the beauty of our, of our faith with others. And so you have like Bishop Barron's word on fire ministry or, you know, the Augustine Institute, some of the great uh, material they're putting out. But I, I would say to the, the comment too, you know, Yes, we need to share the charisma. We need to be able to proclaim it. But, but the most powerful way that we reveal the truth of our faith is by the way we live. And that so, yeah, the soup kitchen does have a power, you know, because we believe that every human being is made in the divine image, and every human being is of such worth that Jesus Christ gave his life on Calvary for that person. Um, so that should change the way that we treat other people. And um, and so, yeah, those, I think Mother Teresa was a great evangelist. <laughs> um, and, but, and she spoke very simply, uh, but her actions and what her sisters did were eloquent. I like that answer. That was very well said. I don't think I could have said a better answer at all. I like the way you connect the charisma in the soup kitchen, because I think we often want to choose one or the other. All right, you want to choose another number? Nine. I think this is a good opportunity. So Leslie from Columbia, South Carolina asks, what's the best thing we can pray for our bishop? And Christopher from Columbia, South Carolina asks... How can the laity best support our bishops and the church in the fulfillment of our collective mission? Hmm. Yeah, I would certainly pray for us. Pray for us that, um, you know, we've been given an awesome responsibility to be the successors to the apostles. I always take comfort because, you know, the, the apostles were so honest and we, and we find it in the gospels and the Acts of the Apostles. They 
They weren't the sharpest knives in the drawer, and and uh, Jesus chose them in some ways because he likes to use weak human instruments to make it clear that it's he he's working, not not this human being, flawed human being. But yeah, please pray for for me. Pray for your bishop. Um, the Holy Spirit will guide us and and help us be good shepherds, shepherds that are willing to lay down our life for our flock and that will be good teachers of the faith. Um, I think uh, those are the most important things. Um, and then, you know, um, I, I am really edified by so many of our lay Catholics and the way that they're living out the faith. That's what really gives me energy when I would just had um, a breakfast, a mass and a breakfast with the focus missionaries that work here in the Archdiocese of Kansas City. And just to hear what they were, how they're sharing the gospel and the, the, their love for the Catholic faith with their with college students. Um, and so, you know, one of the best thing you can do for us is be what Pope Francis calls missionary disciples, to to know your faith and to be trying to live it with fidelity and integrity and to share it with others. Uh, that way you're helping us do our mission, because I'm responsible for every soul in Northeast Kansas, not just the registered parishioners, um, but every, every person. And, and of course, I can't do much as one person, but I'm, I'm so grateful for my brother priest for all that they do and our consecrated religious when consecrated life is lived well it's it's leaven and light in the diocese but our lay people you know you're really you you have the opportunity uh, to reach so many that I'll never be able to reach by podcast or in in church um, and and um, you know you have are you saying our secular friends don't always tune into and Ask a Bishop podcast? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so they, they're not always in the cathedral church or, or wherever I might be. Um, so, you know, to to be out there on the front lines and to take up this this call, this commission that's really been given to all of us to, to make disciples. And, you know, if our Catholic faith is the most important thing in our life, then why wouldn't we share it with somebody else if it helps us find meaning and purpose and um, and gives us peace and, and joy, we have to share it with others. Beautifully said. If you don't mind, I'm actually going to choose the last question because I think it's a nice segue from what you just said. There's a question on family evangelization from Lawrence from New Orleans, Louisiana. And Lawrence asks, as a recent convert to Catholicism, how would you recommend I pass the faith on to my children? Specific recommendations and or general advice are both welcome. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, great question, and, and uh, I'm glad that you chose this one because you know I think marriage and the family are really at the heart of the of how the church historically has passed the faith on, and we we honor parents as they're the first teachers of their children of the faith, and I say this often again in my confirmation homilies that the most influential teacher of the faith to me was my mother. Um, and my mother, she lived to 97. She had a long life and in many ways uh, a good life, but not an easy one uh, because um, when she was 25 and pregnant with me, my father went to work and never came home. He was murdered at his job. And her life you know, changed dramatically at that point and what she thought it was going to be and what she anticipated it would be. And of course, I was immune. I was in her womb. I, I didn't know what was going on. But when I got to be older and I, I began to ask family members and friends of my parents, uh, and they told me how my mother, you know, she grieved my father's death, but um, at the same time, um, she still had a hope about her and a peace about her. And she, she wound up, she believed, she didn't believe my father's death was what God desired that that was a result of sin, but um, but that she believed that God was faithful and he was still with her and he could bring good even out of this tragedy and he could bring life even out of death. So she went back to school, became a 
got her degree, became a teacher, became a principal. And I don't know if that would have happened had uh, my father lived, but she, I would, when I was doing confirmations in St. Louis, where I'm from, um, oftentimes the parents or the, the, the sponsors would come up afterwards, and they didn't care I was, if I was a bishop or not, but they wanted to talk to me because I was Mrs. Nauman's son and tell me how she had influenced their life. Um, so I just share that with you because I think it's in the family. Uh, the family is so important, and and you know as much as um, you can, just to be a witness to the to the faith and to to show how important it is to you and to as a family to pray together. We always prayed the rosary uh, as a family. I, I didn't always appreciate it as a, when I was a child, but. Uh, now I do. I'm, many families, you know, I think they read the Sunday readings before they go to Mass, and they they talk about what their meaning is. Um, to have family meals together is so important, and to make that prayer at, at the meal, you know, uh, significant. So, you know, I think that, that parents really have this um, this. Well, children are supposed to make their parents into saints, so <laughs> they they give a lot of operate, opportunities for heroic love. Um, but all of that is having a great impact. And but I think you know, uh, I know one of the things that impacted me was we lived. My grandparents lived uh, below us in a two-family flat in South St. Louis, but my grandfather, who was an influential fa father figure, he went every Saturday morning at 2 a.m. to our, um, our our parish where they had a perpetual adoration. But I thought, wow, you know, that he was getting up at 2 in the morning to, to go and pray in church really made an impression on me uh, on the importance of the faith. So I think, you know, just living your faith authentically and, 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 and not being afraid to have conversations with your children and sharing with them what a difference it makes in your life. And, and um, yeah, I, I, I just uh, think the marriage is so important, and it was, it was the Christian understanding of marriage and family life that helped evangelize the, the, the ancient world, you know, because Christians had a different view of what marriage was. And um, and saw this this incredible gift that God called the people to love each other in, in this way that most closely resembles the way Christ loves the church, um, to live that vocation of Christian marriage and then Christian parenthood. Uh, it's, it's, it's so important, but it's challenging. And, you know, my role, the roles of the priest are to try and help uh, nourish our everybody in the parish but especially married couples to live their their marriage and to live their vocation in, in the Christian family with joy and with fidelity beautiful beautifully played well thank you for your time Archbishop and thank you to everyone who sent in questions and yeah everyone who watched or listened to this yeah yeah well it was a privilege to be with you and thanks Joe for the ministry that you do not just with the podcast but for Catholic Answers and and um, yeah thanks for I, I like listening to you on Catholic Answers and and hear you field some difficult questions and <laughs> it's nice to turn the tables on you this time <laughs> so <laughs> yeah yeah so thanks God bless Thank you for listening to Shameless Popery, a production of the Catholic Answers Podcast Network. Find more great shows by visiting catholicanswerspodcast.com or search Catholic Answers wherever you listen to podcasts.